Are the Yankees in big trouble? Will Fred draft any of them? Who are the guys that Fred are drafting right now in his fantasy baseball dress? All that and more on the Rotowire Fantasy Baseball Podcast. Greetings, everybody. Welcome to the Rotowire Fantasy Baseball Podcast, brought to you by Fantrax and Rival Fantasy. Jeff Erickson here with Fred Zinke. The New York Yankees, are they in big trouble? Garrett Cole, has. you're going for more exams on his elbow. Aaron Judge has a sore oblique. Fred, is it panic time in New York? Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> had a few words. Aaron, yes. I mean, I mean yeah. the Aaron Judge thing, like, whatever. The Yankees have lived with Aaron Judge in and out a little bit before, but this Garrett Cole, this is a big, big deal. Yeah. Uh, combine that with Carlos Rodon not having a good spring, and uh, yeah, this is a big deal. Yeah, it is. Well, let's start off with Garrett Cole. Um, you know, it came down Monday morning. I'm getting on a, you know, every time I fly, bad news happens. When I was flying back to Wichita on Friday, uh, I land in Wichita, Noel Valle Marte suspended for 80 games. I I, got, I get off my plane in Denver from Wichita to Denver, and Garrett Cole's getting his elbow looked at. What the heck? Stop doing this. Make this and make the machine stop. <laughs> stop traveling around, uh, Jeff. You're you're. Uh, oh, and that's you're not happening. Everyone. No. It's yeah, not I'm going to happen. Tout Wars this weekend, and then Vegas for the NFBC. Good grief. Look yeah, more below. injuries coming. Anyways, okay, Garrett Cole. Where would you draft him if you were drafting tonight? And you can't say you wouldn't because you would at some point. I would at some point. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be. Not in the ace tier. I I think I'm 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 gonna, I'm pulling up ADP on that, but I want to say like pick fifty is my first inclination is, is to say that. Uh, but since Monday he has gone. Uh, there have now been since Monday there have been, which is yesterday by the way. Uh, there have been twelve pick uh, twelve drafts. Garrett Cole's ADP it, it, it was six drafts going into tonight. Uh, and his ADP was like 28, and I think it's probably a lot lower now. It's so it's I've got I've it's, got six drafts that ended today. Yeah, and his ADP was 74. Yeah, now I'm probably like, going to be at least that level. I'm thinking there could be a slow draft too in there because his min picks 20, so there could be a slow draft in there. Or someone min pick, I got min pick is 16, including Monday, so that tells you something there. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and. It's funny. I was covering a draft. Is a best ball draft on Sirius XM Fantasy Day. Someone drafted him in the first round. I was like, "What? What? What?" We couldn't get a hold of the guy, but he won the league last year, so maybe he knows something. But, oh, forget um, him. <laughs> that maybe he knows something positive. I mean, he obviously knows something, but I'm, you know what I mean. Like he might have known something. But if you just look at just pitchers, um, you tell me when to stop. Yeah, you know, uh, Strider, obviously Burns, Wheeler, Castillo, Yamamoto, Kirby, Glass, now Lopez. Gallon, Scoobal, Gossman, Webb, Nola, Valdez, Peralta, Gilbert, Grayson Rodriguez, Bobby Miller, Cole Reagans, Yuri Perez, Blake Snell, Zach Eflin, Jesus Luzardo, Joe Ryan, Justin St okay. Whew. I was wondering if you were still alive out there. Um, <laughs> uh, just a time delay coming up to Canada. Yes. Uh, I actually meant to stop after the third pitcher. No, I'm yeah. just kidding. <laughs> uh, no, that, so I actually, the reason, so I could have uh, answered it quicker because I had to adjust my rankings at the Yahoo site today. Uh, well, tonight. And I put them right after Joe Ryan, by the way, I would drop Blake Snell. I would put him in head of Blake Snell probably. Cause I've dropped Snell a lot because. Yeah, of, me too. I mean, like, What's going to happen? Two weeks right away. Now. Yeah. One so, week. Well, yeah. And one two week or three or whatever, Dodgers right? So Padres. the 28, 16 days from now is the uh, on American soil opening day. Anyways, yeah. I put him right behind Joe Ryan. So I was just waiting for you to say his name. So that kind of makes him like your SP3, yeah. right? Maybe like a late SP2, depending on how you built your pitching staff, but mm -hmm. probably your SP3. So. And I'm having a hard time statistically giving, you know, doing the projection because I've got them at 27 starts now and I probably need it. And that's, that's yeah. after I did it. I went from 33 to 30 to 27, but that just feels like it's, you know, algorithm wise, it still has them pretty darn high. I, I feel like I need to change that. So I'm going to, while we're talking, as a matter of fact, talking and having a good time. Um, Cause I can always put them back up, you know, but the fact is he's not going to be ready for opening day. Um, I've got him at 20 starts now. 
That sounds more like it, right? Um, yeah. I mean, or I could yeah, just change the effectiveness, I suppose. Because I mean, yeah, like it's it seems very, very likely that uh, he's going to miss whatever. Let's say, like, well, twenty star, twenty starts. Yeah, that's fine. I think that's one hundred and twenty innings. I mean, maybe you maybe you draft him and you get lucky and you get twenty five starts, but but maybe you get zero or maybe you get whatever twelve or something like that. So yeah, I think twenty starts is fair. Yeah. Because even with like, like even with most of the other pitchers, I don't predict thirty-two starts. Yeah, yeah, and that's why I think twenty-seven wasn't enough of a haircut. So right, yep. and, and it's also tricky too because you got to like kind of factor in, you know, okay, is he going to have the same fastball when he comes back? Is he going to throw the same pitch mix as when he comes back? Mm -hmm. well, if he comes back, I mean, the fact is they're going for you know, usually second opinions aren't a good thing, you know. Check me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we've actually had a, uh, you know, I don't think we've gotten the second opinion back on uh, Lucas Giolito yet, have we? Yes, Lucas Giolito set for surgery. I okay, he is. I didn't. I did yeah. miss that. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I had well, already dropped him to the very, very bottom of my rankings in the the do not draft category. So, oh, that one I didn't see resonate. the I see the note now. That must have happened yeah. when I was out tonight. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, I got to zero him out now. Uh. So tough break there but uh okay that's another news and note what's happening <laughs> actually not to get off topic but what's happening here is nfl free agency is drowning out some of these baseball stories like it's not drowning out garrett cole but right. some of these things like giolito in your twitter feed or just yeah. in the general news feed is getting are getting drowned out i mean this and i and we I had a period of mourning already on giolito too right you know that's so. right so it was kind of just confirmation so yeah. i love nfl free agency but it, it'll die off here in a day or two and then uh, right. you'll get these baseball stories back, but they were harder to find yesterday and today because of that. Yeah, you're right about that. So yeah. my bad on missing that one there. Uh, things have been a little hectic in my world too, uh, for what it is worth. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, you know, and I don't know, would you draft them at that spot? Let me ask you that. I mean, you have them there, mm -hmm. but under the, under the gun, are you actually going to do it? Mm. So... Uh... Uh, yeah, I think maybe, yes, I think maybe somewhere around there. Yeah. After Joe Ryan's gone. So we're looking at, I was doing a slow draft right now and I think Joe Ryan went in like round eight or so. So mm -hmm. like I said, like my SP three, maybe like round nine. I mean, if it doesn't work out, if you actually get zeros out of them, you could still win your league with yeah. a zero, a zero from there. It's trickier in the main event ones that we talk about probably more than we should because we're influenced by it, but it's not what most people play, but it's trickier, but it cuts both ways in the main event one. Like he's actually a really interesting risk in round like eight or nine in a main event, because if you did get 25 or 26 starts out of, out of Garrett Cole, like it could propel your team towards winning a giant contest like that. Right. Like the mm -hmm. nothing ventured, nothing gained. Uh, well, I remember scary. when Clayton Kershaw had a little scare in spring training and people dropped him like the third round and he was just like, had his, be one of his best years ever. Mm -hmm. And people got the windfall. Um, and they're like, man, I should have taken the chance. Now Cole isn't quite Pete Kershaw in terms of like compared to the pack. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, Strider has been going ahead of Cole all year long. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's kind of opening. I don't think I would. And I don't think I would take, you know, I guess there is a point. Maybe I would take him ahead in that Joe Ryan range, but ahead of Yuri Perez, who has his own innings uh, issues there. I don't take, I would not take Dylan Cease ahead of, of Garrett Cole. I would not take Chris no. Sale or Alex Musgrove or Joe Musgrove. I don't know why I said Alex. I was looking at, no, I was looking at Alexis Diaz who's right above Joe Musgrove. I wouldn't take Musgrove. I'm down on Musgrove too. That's a guy I'm just not taking. So um, no, I, I don't think I take Garrett Cole there. So, but I mean, it's, it's maybe I would, uh, we'll see. I, I, there's one draft where he went, where Garrett Cole went 175 today, 170, no, 134 today. I take that back. It was yesterday. It was one seven. Yeah, that's kind of what I was talking about. Like round eight, nine, like like round 30, 134 is like late round nine. I think once you drop another tier from those pitchers, it's like mm -hmm. the There's Merrill Kelly, yeah. the Merrill. Ke we talked about this tier last week, but the Merrill Kelly, Chris Bassett, Jose Barrios. I think I'm okay with maybe passing up on one of those guys to try for Garrett Cole. Yeah. So, uh, so maybe, maybe there's certain pitchers in the Dylan Cease tier that like, that you're not going to like, like you don't like Joe Musgrove. We both don't like Dylan Cease, like, et cetera. But, um, but then there might be some pitchers in that tier you do like, but then I think once we get out of that tier and we 
past like round 10 or so. And the, again, we get to the Chris Bassett, Barrios, Carlos Rodon, Shane Bieber, all those guys. I think maybe I would try Cole over all of them. Yeah, uh, I think you're right about that. Um, I mean, it's going to swing in the next few days. Like we're going to get more information probably on Cole yeah. by the weekend. Yeah. Um, don't careful on victory lapping on a pitcher injury. Other players get hurt too, guys. Yep. Um, I, I don't, 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 don't get too, too uh, pr- you know, proud of uh, that, that not missing out on that one. There, there will be others that come your way. Um, let's talk about Aaron judge. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he's are you, well, no, I, t- I take that back. I want to talk about one other thing. Cole related. Is that push any other starters up for you? Are you more inclined to go hitter, hitter, hitter to start? Uh, what is your other reaction to this? Yeah, it doesn't really change anything else for me. Um, I was all, already going hitter, 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 a lot of leagues to start. Okay. Um, so it doesn't, doesn't really, or at least hitter, hitter. So it doesn't really change change much for me. I don't think I'm going to take this and then all of a sudden make Corbin Burns a first rounder. Or I know some people are talking that Zach Wheeler could go like more on the one, two turn when we get to main event drafts, which he might. I, I get that. But um, it doesn't really change anything else for me. I've been pretty comfortable i don't have any strider i wish i did uh but i've been once strider's gone i've been pretty comfortable just waiting for whatever does seven, eight, that and pitchers off the board does that answer change if you're drafting 13 14th 15th in a 15 teamer are you more inclined to take a starter in that second round knowing that you're almost certainly not going to get the starting a top tier starting pitcher in that three four turn no uh, it doesn't it doesn't really because it doesn't change my valuation of of Zach Wheeler. Like I would already consider Corbin Burns at any point in round two. Like, I think once we get to round two, I think he's fair game anywhere you want. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if I'd take him for sure, but I would certainly consider it, but uh, it doesn't really change. Because Again, like I say, it doesn't change my valuation of Zach Wheeler. And for example, how much Wheeler separates from Logan Webb or how much he separates from, Kevin Gosman, who you might be able to get at the end of round three right now in some leagues. He went you round will. four in my most yeah. recent draft. So uh, Tyler Glass now, um, et cetera. So anyways, pick Watch your Glass guys. now go higher, by the way. Watch he, that. He, that's one that's going to spike, I think. Yeah. Especially he, in the NFBC, if the, the team, the Dodgers and Padres, there are leagues where you're going to get a free, you're going to get the free look yep. at the Dodgers, uh, the, that two game series in Korea. Um, you might push glass now higher knowing his his result if he he, he dominates the padres i you might see him at the two three turn all of a sudden yep. even though we don't know how many eggs he's going to throw uh yeah or, it's, it's kind of silly in the sense that like i don't think anyone's debating that glass now is going to be good on a per start basis the the yeah. issue is how many starts is he going to make you and get then, an extra start basically that's him right so getting the one play. extra start i don't see why that moves him up a whole round but i but we this is how we are this is how humans are confirmation bias sure. or recency bias and Right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Aaron judge, um, got an oblique. He's not going to hit for a few days. Did you change anything in his projection? So I haven't moved him yet. Uh, the interesting thing about judge is, uh, I got into like a interesting conversation on Twitter before our labor draft about him where I mentioned, so you can, you can, on the fan graph site, you can take like you can get uh, projected dollar values on steamer projections and then the bat projections and then the bat X and then ATC and et cetera, zips and all these things. If you do that, or at least in mid February, if you did that uh, judge would come out as the second or third most valuable hitter uh, in all the different, almost all the different projection systems. He was second or third. So with me picking fourth in the, labor draft and knowing that judge was not going to go in the top three, it just created this interesting dilemma in my head where I was like, well, if all of these projection systems that people believe in, um, keep spitting him out in the top two or three, like, why am I not considering him? And last year he was a top three pick. Like, why am I not considering him fourth overall? And I didn't end up moving him up to fourth overall. I still have him like 11th or so uh, overall. And as we got debating this on Twitter and some, some people in the industry kind of jumped in, like, it was just that like, like maybe the projection systems aren't giving enough weight to, the size of Aaron judge and like his propensity for nagging injuries throughout his career. And he's had some healthy seasons, but he's definitely had plenty of seasons with some injuries. So, um, and here we are and we'll see if he misses any game time, maybe he won't, but it's just a reminder. I think that that's the reason that Aaron judge is sitting in the back half of the first round, because if we believed in his durability more, he probably would be a top five pick. 
as he was last season. Exactly. Right. And that again was recency bias. And I was in on it for sure. Um, where he had been, had been healthy the previous year. And then you get like, okay, well maybe we're out of the woods. Maybe judge has figured out how to stay healthy. Like that doesn't really, if you just have to look on his own team, like with Stanton where, you know, Stanton has had some seasons where he stayed healthy, but overall in fantasy, if every year, if you just bet on Stanton, not to stay healthy, you were right a lot more than you were wrong. Yeah. I think the other, I think the other question with judge is, is he going to run? Uh, because of that toe, yeah. he didn't run after that. Uh, I yeah. redu- I had originally had him projected for nine bags, and it was more of a weighted average thing. I've got him down to five now, um, and that that cuts down on his value. So you know, and I'll say the same thing you were saying about the projection systems. My projection spit him out as like player two or three mm-hmm. at one point in time. Yep. Um, and then I, you I, shave off a little playing time, and then all of a sudden he falls to the back half where he goes. Yeah. I guess if I was drafting tonight. Um, I would take guys like Trey Turner and Matt Olson ahead of them just because like they look much, much more likely to start the season in, in the lineup. Agreed. Right. And like, why am I, ch- if judge already has an injury, why am I chasing like, right. like a Jordan Alvarez fresh? and Trey Turner for me, go ahead. I think Jose Ramirez Olson, my projection says he should go ahead of him. I'm, I don't know if I can actually commit to the bit. I might actually go Otani ahead of him. Um, yep. ahead of judge I'm talking about Aaron judge here, by the way, when I say him, yep. um, just yeah, you know, we, we play the if game with Aaron Judge. His his middle nickname, sh- I mean, his middle name should be if if Aaron Judge did this. If I mean, mm-hmm. it, it's a big big question mark. But uh, and he, we saw it in his contract year. That's what happens when Aaron Judge stays healthy. He obliterates everything. He obliterates the field. I mean, he 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 was not he wasn't as head and shoulders ahead like Acuna was last year. But man, he he crushed. He mm-hmm. he really crushed. Uh, so there you go. Um, okay. Let's move on to other news items here. But before we do that, let's take care of a little bit of initial business. We got two notes today from our, our sponsors. First, Fantrax. Fantrax is the most customizable fantasy platform in the industry, offering the greatest fantasy experience for your dynasty keeper, redraft, and best ball leagues. Coming from another service, Fantrax makes it easy. Fantrax can import any of your current leagues and customize if needed. Fantrax offers the most in-depth player pool in the industry, including minor league players. Do you need a customizable commissioner service for your fantasy league? Fantrax offers more customization than any other platform. Waivers, categories, scoring system, schedule. Fantrax offers custom solutions for all that and more, and it's all free. Sign up for free today and be entered to win an official MLB signed jersey from Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Simply go to Fantrax.com slash Rotowire and sign up today. That's F-A-N-T-R-A-X.com slash Rotowire. Fantrax, the home fantasy sports i'm jeff erickson he's fred zinke you can read our work at rotowire and yahoo respectively uh taj bradley missed his start today uh had mr and is gonna have an mri for pectoral tightness yuck yeah we'll see where where this all comes back but uh raised pitchers i don't know they're great but they do they, we have had some serious injuries to some raised pitchers so we'll see where this comes um yeah, maybe maybe it's nothing, but it's definitely really cooled me on Bradley. I think I have him in one league so far. He's on a sleepers article. He's in a sleepers article that I have coming out tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And we just put a note on the bottom that like you'll have to pause that sleeper stance, you know, until you, we see what happens here. But right. um, he's an interesting one in the sense that like like he already was going in round whatever seventeen something like that. So like. Like if if you find out that he's gonna have to be a draft and stash guy, then uh, like is is he worth drafting? Right. I think he is. Uh, well, we'll see. We'll see what the. I guess I shouldn't go too far ahead. We'll see what the prognosis is. He he was a trendy weight on pitching guy. He's he's one of those end game, yeah. not mid game guys. I should say not end game, but mid game. <sighs> yeah. Guys. I only had him for 118 innings though. Uh, 25 starts, 118 innings because the Rays usage. They don't let you know, so that's less than five innings to start. So I was already kind of, you know, a little, little. I, I grabbed him in a league or two. I think I'm not ba- grabbing him solely on project on the. Pro- I'm grabbing him on projecting what he could be, not his baseline projection. I should say. Right. Yeah. I just with his strikeout rate. Um there was a chance that he could be really valuable. Like if he did throw 150 innings, he could strike out 180 batters. So uh, yeah, there was a chance that he could be really valuable. When I was doing my projections, like I gave him a decent amount of innings, like 140 or so. And with the strikeout rate, he was 
fairly high on my list. Now his ratios were so bad last year, but one thing is I did trust the Rays to maybe get him, you know, a little more under control on a, like as far as his ratios went, but anyways, it, it may all, well, it, we'll see. I, I still think we're going to see moments of him being in lineups this year. We'll just see where this all comes back. We're talking about uh, Taj Bradley, by the way, want to yeah. just repeat the name just for authority's yeah. sake. Cause there's lots of hymns on the there Rays. A few where, hymns around major league baseball. Well, especially on the Rays though, too, that we're not sure how many innings we're going to get. Same thing. Same thing holds true with Shane Boz. Ryan yep. Pepio for the hat matter was hurt for a while. Actually, people forget that. And they, you know, they, they, they also forget that Pepio did his damage against weak lineups in September. So I like Pepio. I w I have Pepio in leagues, but I think there's some concern there. I actually like Zach Littell. Uh, I, I think his, his spot in the rotation is pretty secure now. I like Zach Littell as a, he, he's, he's super cheap too. Yeah. I, he's someone who I've been drafting actually a lot. People don't really seem that into him. I get it. He's not really like a name guy. Um, but you know, his ratios were really good last year, even in the rotation. He's someone who, uh, who doesn't walk many batters, which should keep his whip down. Um, yeah, we're, we're, he goes even later than Bradley has been going. So he's yep. someone who I've been drafting, like I find as my like ninth or 10th pitcher. Like, exactly. Right around, around 23. Exactly. Uh, um, again, low, maybe a bit of a low ceiling in the sense of he's, but but like he's just not going to be a strikeout guy. I, the ceiling isn't really that low. Like if if he has a low whip because of the lack of walks and and if let's say he had a mid three ZRA and a, and a nice like one point one five whip or something like that, gets his share of wins. That's really good, even if the strikeout rate's not great. And the strikeout rate's not like Miles Michael is terrible. It's just not great. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that's why you get a little of Zach Littell late. Get an yeah. extra guy there. I, you know, you, you get, a, and I, I am running something uh, where I'm getting a ton of starters late after starting with pocket aces. I kind of went away right. from it for a while and just built a ton, a ton of bats in the middle there. And I found that I, I, I was uncomfortable with the build at first. I'm more happy, more comfortable with it now. And especially because my bench is going to have five or six starting pitchers, probably, or at least five or six pitchers at the, at, out of seven. And I feel comfortable with that sort of build. Like Jose Quintana, Miles Michaelis are there for you too. And those guys still have value. Those guys still can be useful. You know, you spot them. They're streamers, but you, you know, you're streaming at the back end of the draft instead of from the waiver wire, I feel like. And there's something to be said for that too. So in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. Um, in the Tower Wars draft and hold, I picked up a bunch of these guys late. Steven Matz, Jose Rikidi, who's actually having a nice spring, mm -hmm. um, who was, I think, like in round like 17 or so pick last year. Um and then just had a total washout year. wasn't healthy. didn't pitch well. I picked up Tyone, Jamison Tyone as, you know, as a bench pick, like, like you're mm -hmm. right, picking up these guys and this is a draft and hold. So obviously I can't use the waiver wire in this, but even, your same point I think is in a regular league is do you want to be trying to find starting pitching on the waiver wire? Or do you want some of these guys who aren't great, but at least you can stream them based on matchups, who's been pitching well lately, things like that. Like you can, you're better to have maybe some of these guys on your roster. Um, yeah. Debating those players versus the relievers, like just late rounds. Do you want Miles Michaelis or do you want Hector Neris, for example? Hector Neris is going to get help your ratios, but there's. But are you actually going to use Hector Neris? That's well, I, I think at the beginning of the year you might, like Maybe. between the half week and not having starters in the half week, and then just and then if you if you draft a couple injured players. Um, like I have a team where I just drafted, uh, Sonny Gray. So I need a guy at the beginning. I have John means on a couple teams as like a late round type guy. I'm going to need to cover him for a few weeks. So some of those relievers at the beginning, you may, you may use them for a week or two. I don't think you're keeping them all year. Um, and, unless you strike lightning in a bottle. That's the other beautiful thing too. Right. Well, I guess you can say the same thing about relief pitchers that aren't closers too. Um, I, yeah. I think at most I'm going to have one bench reliever. I'm mostly going to have starting yeah. pitchers. And yeah. I will try to like, I have, I have Jose Alvaro, uh, Alvarado in a league. I might go Kirkering there um, as maybe as a possibility. Um, you know, Ted, Ted, Ted says some good guys, but all these guys go earlier than I think you think, Ted. Um, and I'm, some of those are just audio only. He says stack low whip upside guys, Cutter Crawford, Christopher Sanchez, Ryan Pepio, Reese Olsen, Bailey Ober. Those guys are going in the in the teens and in oh, yeah, like, teens and yeah, like Bailey, Bailey Ober's Ober going in a single digit round. Yes, um, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so just be aware that you know those are all great names, yep. and I I love guys and 
you mentioned low whip and that's great. And uh, that is especially because I look at low walk percentage guys. If you want to dig mm-hmm. even a little deeper, all those guys are pretty good at uh, preventing walks. Not all of them, but most of them are pretty good at it. Christopher Sanchez, Cutter Crawford. I mean, that's my wheelhouse. I like those guys a lot, but they're going higher and higher. And ba- Bailey over is going way high. Everybody, you know, who loves a Bailey over everybody. everybody. And <laughs> that's going to be one of the themes of, of this, this particular podcast, actually, because uh, it's, it, they're players that are on our list. All right. Uh, before we get into some of the guys that Fred Zinke can't stop drafting, because guess what? That is the title of this segment. Um, we got one. We got uh, one more news and note item, and then we'll uh, we got to share another bit of uh, um, uh, business with you here. But first, Jackson Merrill saw him homer today. Uh, you know, t- he took uh, Zach Gallon deep the opposite way. Later, he barely got out on an infield runner. He just flew though. That's easy speed he has. He may, he's making the team for the Padres. If he's making the team, he's playing. Fred, are you yeah. drafting him? Uh, let's see his ADP. Uh, am I drafting him? Sure. <laughs> how how early is how early do I have to draft? Him? Okay. Well, let, let's okay. Let's six just. I'll today. take. It. Let's Obviously, I'll change a little bit, but he was already getting some buzz. So if I just go like the last two sixty four today, six drafts, a range of two hundred two to three thirty six, wide range, but still, you want to. If you want to expand that range a little bit there, expand the date range a little bit there, maybe that's a at two sixty four. I think that I actually think that's fair, and I would be I'm ready to draft him there. Except that I think after this news, he's going to be more around two hundred. Well, yeah, and see the thing is, this is why you have to put a date range on your ADP uh, yeah. because Jackson Merrill from March first, his ADP was three twenty three with a range of two hundred two to four ninety six. Those days are long gone. Yeah. Um, if I'm just looking at other shortstops, so why I, I looked at the last few, I don't know, I forget what I put in, but like the last three days, Ezekiel Tovar is at 191. Uh, would I take Jackson Merrill over Ezekiel Tovar? No, I don't no, know. I, wouldn't, I, would. I would not. Um, yeah. I would not either. I, I, now, Jackson Tovar's... Merrill's going to get shortstop and outfield eligibility. That yeah. helps. Uh, if he's, yeah. There's some guys like around like, like Stephen Kwan's at 211. I would rather take him. So Jeremy, if I'm now I'm jumping back to shortstops, Jeremy Pena and Carlos Correa are around 230 in that range. Mm-hmm. I think I think I I think I'm in there. So if he wants to hang around until around around that stage and I was looking for an infielder, then I would take him. But um I, I'm I'm sure I'll have no Jackson Merrill. Not because I don't believe in him, just I'm sure other people will want him more. I have yeah. like none of the prospects this year. So I got my first share of Jackson Holiday in my AL nice. only league. Uh, where I, I I paid like the equivalent of ten bucks. We have a weird uh, system. Value. We instead of two sixty, it's an old old school AL only four by four. Mm-hmm. First of all, uh, where uh, and it's instead of two sixty, we go fifteen dollars. You can bid in dime increments because um, that was our, we used that was our actual cost in our league when we started the league in, in our in college day our college days. So. Okay. Uh, that's when Peter Shanky, Herb Ilk, uh, the Newman brothers, Jeff Bookbinder, you don't know them, but Ken Kreitz, you might know. Um, all good players, and we have just go at each other for years and years and years. It's a great league. I love it. Uh, we grandfather in the Brewers because they were in the American League when we started doing this league. So, And it's 11, it's 11 teams, AL only, 4x4 four four plus the Brewers. So um, player pool is actually a little deeper. I mean, you know, it's a little... Uh, a little more depth to the player pool, but I, I got my holiday there. I did. I, I wanted to get Langford and I got outbid on him and I, I bumped him up a couple times over that one's Langford's just not coming cheap holiday. There's still that chance. He begins the year in the minors still, although I don't think he will. I, I just, I, every time I watch him, I think he's ready. Um, and that's dangerous to watch him, but he was doing it against Zach Wheeler the other day. And if he can hang with Zach Wheeler, he can hang with anyone. That was kind of my interpretation. So anybody named Jackson holiday, Merrill, Cheerio, it's a good time to be a prospect named Jackson. It's true. There you go. Maybe that can be your, can you come up with the Jackson five? If you can find enough Jacksons, uh, Ooh, maybe you can there's, name a your, challenge. there's a great team name is to draft them all and then come up with, uh, and then be the Jackson five for your team. Jackson name. Job, another, you know, he could close for the tigers yeah. through 101 today. Uh, a, got a save. Uh, could happen. Jackson draft Drew, and hold, for the season. Maybe you yeah. could, could do that yeah. uh, on the NFBC ADP. There are five, Jacksons, but you're gonna have to go all the way down to Luke Jackson with an ADP of 848 here yep. in the last few days. But you yep. can get five Jacksons that way. Maybe you just name your team the Jackson Four. <laughs> yeah, still, still fine. Still a great name. Yeah, yep. 
Action Jackson. You could do lots of different things. There yeah, still. for sure. Um, and boy, oh boy, we, we've now we've gone off the rails a little bit. Yeah, we have. All right. Sounds like a good time to uh, do our next uh, bit of business here. And then we'll get the, the players at Fred Zinke can't stop drafting. It's officially fantasy baseball season. It's time for MLB best ball on Rival Fantasy. That's right. Rival Fantasy now has best ball. Full season lobbies are live now until opening day with both fast and slow drafts. Then weekly and daily drafts will be available from opening day through the end of the World Series. Best ball is all the fun of the draft without the season-long management. Enter a league, draft your squad, and the app does the rest. No need to set your lineup or make waiver moves. The highest scores at the end of the regular season will be the winners. Invite your friends and start drafting for the 2024 fantasy baseball season today. Sign up at joinrival.com slash rotowire for a $200 deposit match and $25 in free entries. Welcome to the future of fantasy sports. Welcome to Rival Fantasy. Also, we are on the Blue Wire Network. Here are their ads. All right. Thank you, everybody, uh, for listening to our ads. And if you are listening live, you missed listen to a few of them. But uh, we want to talk about the headline topic here. People that Fred Zinke can't stop drafting. And the funny thing is, we we talked about Bailey Ober earlier. You thought you'd be you know, be your most roster player. You got him, I think, in AL. I mean, mixed labor to get when we the draft we did together. But you found that hey, everybody loves Bailey Ober, so it's not your most rostered player. Yeah, he was someone who when I ran my when I did my projections at the start of the season, I was like, oh, this guy's going like way too late. Todd Zola was on him. I'm going to give Todd credit. I think Todd was on him first. Yep, talking to him, and I, I but I want to say that I was. I feel like I hadn't heard anyone else on Bailey Ober except for me. And I bet if I went back and found the first like spring training article I wrote for Yahoo before spring training even opened, it was talking about Bailey Ober as one of my guys this year, because again, he came out in my projections as like a, an eighth round pick and he was like a 10th round pick. And I was like, Oh, he's my, my, like my third starter or whatever in every draft this year for sure. But now everybody's on him because when you run the numbers, like, he just makes so much sense. Like all you really need him to do is just do what he's done so far in his career over 30 starts. You don't really need him to be any better. Um, he says to be the same thing. Just take his, his career ERA, his career whip, put it over his career strikeout rate, put it over 30 starts and Bailey over belongs in round eight. So, but everybody else has kind of cut on to that. And I have him in our labor league because labor draft was a little earlier and yep. he hadn't really moved so much, but I'm finding Before the lately, simpletons caught up to you and your brilliance there. Everybody copied me. So when I took him, I took him actually early in round nine in the labor draft. And I was like, Oh, this is early, but because I was at that end with you because I was pick four where it was either early in round nine or late in round 10. And I was like, Oh, I don't not that confident. He'll come back to late in round 10 and I kind of need a starter. So anyway, so I took him. Um, but now that feels like actually just his ADP, maybe even a little, actually, it's actually a little later than his mm -hmm. ADP in the last few days. So, so anyways, these are the players that we're going to talk about tonight who I've actually drafted in between labor and tout wars and some nfbc leagues who i'm actually ending up with on my roster not necessarily the guys i thought i would end up with on my roster right and starting off at catcher nobody um you you vary your picks is that because you don't love a particular catcher or that you like the pool enough that you're kind of agnostic yeah i like a lot of them uh there's a lot of catchers who go and say rounds like 10 to 13 uh let's see so Logan O'Hoppy, Bo Naylor, Mitch Garver, um, Cal Rowley. Um, anyways, there's a handful of them, and I'm I kind of like all of them. I'm fine with any of them. So I find I often get a catcher in that range, and then mm -hmm. get one later. Um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't even be opposed to getting two in that range, just if that's the way the draft fell to me. Well, I think that's a great strategy, actually. In fact, I saw that in the best ball league we did. And they only start one catcher in this one, but it's best ball, so you can't pick up anybody. Mm -hmm. So someone double-tapped Ohapi and Naylor together. Right. And I thought that was like in the round 15, 16. Now it's like a 14-team league, and it's best mm -hmm. ball. So those those prices are kind of not representative of what you're necessarily going to find. I think those guys go earlier. In fact, yeah, I'm looking at Naylor. He's 166. Heim's another guy in that range. Yep. So you're talking 11, 12 in a 15 teamer and a 12 teamer. Eh, okay. That, that now you're talking. Yep. And in fact, I'm more likely to wait on catcher in a 12 teamer. Obviously I, you know, yep. I'm, I'm less afraid of, of catcher 23 to 20, you know, 20 to 24 than I am of 25 to 30. 
Yeah, catcher's deep this year. Um, I, in a recent draft, I think I took Danny Jansen in like round like 21, something mm-hmm. like that, 22. Danny Jansen, when he's healthy, is fine. He just gets hurt every year at some point. So, but round 21 for someone who can hit for power. Um, in in the Tout Wars League, I got Jake Rogers in like round like 28 or something like that. Like, like he he's a potentially 20 homer catcher. He's not not awesome. That's why he's available in round 28. But I do feel like catchers deep this year. So anyways, I haven't ended up with I don't have any shares of the elite catchers. I've been I'm not against drafting them. I find they all just go like like a round or two ahead of me. Or I'm often taking pitchers in the rounds where the elite catchers go. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that makes sense. All right. Yeah. So let's move on to other positions. Starting at first base. Pete Alonzo, Andrew Vaughn are your, your two most frequent uh, draftees at first base. Yeah, I have Pete Alonzo. I have both of these guys on almost every team I've drafted so far. I find I'm often drafting in the first half of the first round. By okay. the way, I've really decided, like, I think the middle of the first round is amazing this year. Like, I just, some things have happened. Like, Spencer Strider's having a great spring, which just, I feel like, just kind of cements him as worth it in the top. 10 picks and then Mookie Betts now has the shortstop eligibility coming again. Yeah. Like you were never down on Mookie Betts, but it's just another reason. And you already had like Acuna, Rodriguez, Witt, Carroll. Now you throw those, yeah, like you kind of a little more reason to maybe like Strider and Betts. Kyle Tucker is still a 30 30 potential guy. I love Freddie Freeman always as just a base for a team. I feel like it's a great year to draft in the middle. I find I've often drafted in the front half or towards the middle. And then I often take Alonzo in the second round. Like I've usually get someone in the first round who steals bases and then Alonzo to compliment them contract year. I was really short in power last year in, in all my leagues. So it's been a concerted effort to get some more mm-hmm. power hitting early. And I think the big change too, is the fact that you can get steals at all points in the draft. Um, that makes me more willing to draft to Pete Alonzo. There were years, uh, you know, like last year or going back maybe two, three, four years where I really felt like I couldn't take a first baseman early because all the stolen base guys were going in the first four rounds or something in between pitchers and needing to get some steals, a steals base. I felt like I couldn't take a slugger, but now I don't feel that way at all. There's steals available at all points during the draft. Do you feel that way even if you draft Strider in the first round? Oh yeah. Yeah. I still feel that way. Like I, like, I I don't know. I just feel like in every round I can find someone who steals bases or or every block of like few rounds or whatever. So Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't had a problem getting, and you've talked a lot, actually you've talked a lot this spring about the lack of correlation between steals and overall hitting success on your fantasy team. So uh, it's not like steals is something I feel like I have to win. Um, but even if I started Strider, let's say I started Strider and Pete Alonzo and then still didn't get any steals. Like, let's say I didn't want to reach on CJ Abrams. So I still didn't have any steals. Like I could draft Nico Horner in round four. There's a 40 steal guy yeah. just right there in round so, four or, or just start chipping away with, with a lot of guys, Zach Geloff, TJ Friedel. Like there's a lot of 20 type steal guys that I Right. I like that. I, can I want to clarify one range. thing though, uh, just on yeah. the correlation thing. Um, there's not much correlation between killing the stolen base category right. and yeah. winning you know, overall contests. Um, right. So just I think competitive in it feels fine. Just you have to be competitive in stolen bases. You can't just, at least if you're playing any sort of contest, you can't just mm-hmm. punt it either. There's no, not, there's, there's a lot of negative correlation to punting stolen bases and winning overall. I think there, there's, 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 there's always an exception here and there, but it's, it's really negative correlated there. Um, Andrew Vaughn, let's give him fair due here. You, you have him a lot. Yeah, uh, not with any great enthusiasm. Um, my my thought on Andrew Vaughn, I often, there's a pocket of first baseman I kind of like right around the same spot, and I keep choosing Vaughn out of them. So say like Justin Turner's in that pocket, Ryan Mountcastle, Anthony Rizzo, they're kind of all in that pocket. The thing with Vaughn, the more I kind of broke down that pocket of first baseman, uh, he's young. He could still improve. Like he's a really early MLB draft pick who hasn't, really turned out like he's not great like he was Mm -hmm. supposed to be but he's not terrible his playing time is so locked in on that terrible white Sox lineup like it's not a great lineup but he's playing every day and you know last year he wasn't anything special but he hit 21 homers and drove in 80 runs he hit 258 didn't hurt your batting average like if he just does that again i think he's fine value at his adp and he is still young enough like he'll be 26 
uh, just after opening day. Um, he's still young enough that he could take a step forward. It maybe hits 27 homers or something this year. Um, you know, maybe he pushes his batting average up to 270, 275. That, like all those things I think are in the realm of possibility. When I broke down some of the other players, like just in that pocket, again, I like the first baseman there, but Justin Turner is so old. Like, it's How just, old is he? I, 39, right? I'm pretty sure off the top of my head. is Like he's just, I, I like him and the Blue Jays are super excited about him because they didn't really match else this off season, but he's so old. Uh, Rizzo could totally bounce back, but like, like we've yeah. seen a lot of injuries with Rizzo over the years. Like he could, he could, he could totally bounce back, but um, I don't know. There's still, I still have some question about that. Uh, Ryan Mountcastle, when I dove into him and I, I really wanted to like him more and he could be a great value pick, but he just did not hit righties well at all last year. And like 660 OPS, something like that against righties last year. And, when I step back and look at him, I was like, wait, if he doesn't hit righties very well and he's their DH and that organization is just absolutely loaded with young talent. Like, is there a chance that if he's doing that again this year, that by July, they're like, listen, we, like, we've got to, we got to platoon this guy, right? Like we've got to like limit his playing time. We've got all these young players in the minors who are good. We need to start, start limiting his playing time. So he, I wasn't quite as secure on him. Vaughn is just, I feel like the floor at that point in the draft on Vaughn is just so high. Cause like, what are the white Sox going to do? Not play Andrew Vaughn. Like what else right. are they going to, who else are they going to play? Well, it's just, it's more of a question. Like, is he going to have anybody to knock in or knock exactly. him in? I mean, and that was are, kind they of this... Eloy? are they going, yeah. you know, that that's my bigger concern. Uh, well, we, that's kind of what he did last year. Like last year, he had a 743 OPS, so he wasn't especially good on a terrible offense. So mm. I feel like this year, if there's no growth, his stats will probably look pretty similar to next year. Or, sorry, to last year. But I don't yeah. see him going way backwards. And I don't see the White Sox going way backwards because they were already at the bottom. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> They're already terrible. So I don't think the White Sox are going to be any better this year. I think either he just hits what he did last year or he personally improves somewhat. Cause again, this is someone who was drafted really high in the MLB draft and was expected to be a really good, a really good slugger. And he, he hasn't been yeah. so, but I don't know. I keep ending up with him when we, when I took him, I think we were still on the podcast or we were recapping labor and you were like, Meh, like so boring. And I totally agreed with you, but I keep, I keep coming up with this. Boring I, I, I'm fine with him. I'm, I'm fine with Andrew Vaughn where he goes. I think he's fine. Yeah, I, he's part of, the yeah. first base glob is great. I think there's, yep. I think Justin Turner is underrated. I think he's grossly yep. underrated. In fact, I just downgraded him a little bit because my projection had him way out of step with ADP. I'm like, but I looked at the projection. I'm like, okay, he's 40. I get it. But he also, I mean, is he going to hit like 250? Probably not. He's going to probably hit for average. Probably be no, fine. Yeah. He's probably going to be pretty decent. He's their uh, cleanup hitter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Justin Turner will probably miss some time. That is probably, I, I'll stipulate that. I, I still think where he goes, he, he's a perfectly cromulent option. And you might get him, you might get Justin Turner even cheaper than, you know, you know, I think he he's well below where you should get him. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. Let's move on to another position. Um, okay. Let's move on to second base. Uh, you're getting a lot of Jose Altuve and a lot of Kettle, Kettle Marte. Genstad also is getting a lot of Marte. That strikes me as two people that are smarter than me getting a lot of them, and I don't have any of them. I'm worried. Uh, I, actually, I think Marte is a crom is an earlier cromulent pick. Okay. Uh, if I'm using the word cromulent right, which I don't think I've ever really used much before, but um, he he's just like I feel like he's just really solid. As a, I keep getting him around round eight or so. Uh, I just feel like he's really solid. About 25 homers, plenty of runs in RBI. I like Arizona's lineup. I don't. It's not the Dodgers. It's not the Braves. But it's a it's a pretty good lineup. He's a career 279 hitter. I don't know. I find he he steals the a few bases. They got eight last year. You know. I think he, with the new rules, he could do something like that again. I, I don't know. I just think he's a good, just five kind of five. I don't know if I don't know if eight or ten steals counts as a five category guy anymore. Four and a half. Four and a half. Yeah, he's a good four and a half category eighth round pick. He doesn't sway you your your build in any direction. You're not like, oh I got Marte. Now I need to get an he's average a building guy. block. He's he's he a is. counting stats yeah. building block sort yeah. of guy. He's solid. Yeah. And solid is good. Solid it may not yeah. be fun, but it should be for everyone. Uh yeah. yeah. Go and, and I don't Anyways. think we really need to talk about the merits of Jose Altuve. I you know he 
Maybe he'll drop off in power. He's dropped off before and come back. Maybe he'll drop off in speed. He's dropped off and come back there too. It's just, he is who he is. Yeah, I, I, I like him as almost like a late second round pick. So I keep ending up drafting him in the third. I like him better than Gunnar Henderson. I don't hold, obviously, his fractured thumb against him. Like as far as, as an older player, like he did have the oblique injury last year. I'll hold that against him as an older player. But the thumb injury, that could have happened to anyone like that he suffered at the World Baseball Classic. That's just bad luck. Yeah, totally. He, I'm amazed he bounced back so well from it. That's he did. He, he was awesome last year. Yeah. Like 915 OPS, 921 the year before. Like he's still playing great. The Astros have a great lineup. And then you can see where like the plan all comes together. If you draft Pete Alonso in the second round, Jose Altuve, like the one thing Pete Alonso could hurt you in is the batting average. Jose Altuve is like a nice counteract to, mm -hmm. uh, to Alonso. So, sure. you know, if you draft some sort of speed guy in the first round, I've got some Corbin Carroll, some Julio Rodriguez, but some sort of speed guy, then Pete Alonso, then Altuve, and then it's time to dive into pitching. That's often been my preferred start. I, I like that form, formula. And I like that better than like trying to chase average later with Luis Arias because Arias doesn't right. run, doesn't hit for power at all. Um, and he honestly doesn't score as many runs or knock in as many as you would think either, mm -hmm. given that super high batting average. It's really strange how that works. Yeah. All right. Third baseman. You don't have... A, a pet favorite yet no i don't really love third base this year i find i i find i always get one like i'm not it's outfield when we get to outfield it's outfield that i always end up chasing um i don't end up really chasing third base like i find somewhere through the process i end up with a third or third baseman but it's not a position that like i i got heimer candelario in our um in our uh labor draft I got uh, Muncie, who's better in OBP in the Tout Wars draft. Mm -hmm. And then I got, and I also got Haseon Kim in that draft. Um, but yeah, I find I always get a third baseman, but there's not a third baseman that I'm really into. And and I don't even have like a late round, like bench, cornery. And I always end up with the extra first baseman, like we talked about with Andrew Vaughn. My, my corner, he's always ends, up, always ends up being my corner. So yeah, I don't have a big feel for third base this year. I just Is there a high end third baseman you're avoiding? Like Ramirez or Riley or Devers or I mean Ellie or Gunner. Um, no, I don't. I don't have Ramirez. Actually, I don't have Ramirez as high as where he goes in drafts uh, okay. this year. I find the change in in that for me is um, his stolen bases total has kind of held firm, but other players' stolen bases totals have come way up. So getting like twenty five steals from Jose Ramirez is good, but it's not what it used to be. Like it just doesn't move the needle as much for me. And I think the, the, the guardians lineup's terrible and it was terrible last year. Uh, if you look at the fan graphs, you know, projected standings where it has projected run scored, it's still terrible. So I don't really like him. Like I'd sooner take, I'd sooner take Matt Olson, someone like that. If I haven't had those picks yet, but if I, mm -hmm. if I did, I would have taken Garrett Cole actually too. Right. Uh, that wouldn't have worked out. Um, so anyways, I, I, yeah, I don't, and I haven't had those back end picks. I'm not against Riley. Um, if I was on the back end, but yeah, Ramirez is someone who I won't end up drafting this year. Okay. Fair enough. Um, I, I, I haven't landed him yet. I might have have him in a keeper league somewhere. I would consider him in a tout wars type of format there too. I think that's a little bit different. First yeah, of all, I, OVP, I it's also, it's an auction. Yeah. I definitely don't hate him. It's just, if you're talking about someone in the first round, even at the back end of the first round, like you, you gotta be really good. I, I don't know. He just comes out of my projections just a little bit lower than that. More like a, early to mid second rounder, like say pick like 20, pick eight, 19, but he's always gone before that. Right. Yeah. So you inadvertently left short stops off your outline, Oops. but <laughs> is there, is there a shortstop you're frequently rostering? <sighs> nope. Uh, maybe that's why I left it off. Uh, Zach Neto, I kind of like late. I Look, like that know, one. People are starting to get buzzy on him. He's a little bit of a, a poor man's Bailey over where, uh, you know, Saris was in on him. I'll give you no credit for that. So was I. When I first ran my projections, I was like, hey, Zach Neto looks better than than I thought he would. And I drafted him in our labor draft, round 19. He is my shortstop in that league, uh, not even my middle infielder. Um, and I just remember, you know, mentioned him on the athletic podcast. Um, but I haven't had, I haven't had, yeah, a consistent shortstop. Like I mentioned, I got Kim in Tout Wars. I got Trevor Story in Tout Wars too, but I wasn't super excited about that. Yeah. Um, Reason I like Neto too is, first of all, the, the, there's the prospect pedigree, but secondly, it's the Ron Washington factor. It's yep. the I, I it's the notion that the Angels will run more this year, and Neto is one of the few guys that can really take advantage of that. 
and we saw a little bit so far in spring training, there was a game where they stole like five bases and there's not a ton of things that you can really kind of take to the bank out of spring training, but that seems like one of them to me. So yeah, I, 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 I like Neto and I like him at the price. I still think the price hasn't gone too high yet on him. Uh, he's shortstop 26 ADP since March 1st is 319. Uh, maybe like if you, if you filter that, uh, even let's just say in the last week, uh, we'll do, we'll, we'll do that and see where he, he falls. He's still, you know, it's the same 315 is his ADP range of 249 to 373. Even at his min pick, I don't hate it. And that, that's something yeah. because we're talking still with Zach Neto's min pick being at 249. That's in a, in a 12 team where that's after round 20. That's that's after the second break. If you're live drafting in the NFBC, a 15 teamer, it's still like before it's still like round 17. Sure. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. I also think with Neto um, and like you mentioned with Ron Washington, like, and then that team having a bad lineup, uh, I think between injuries and just like a new manager and whatever, like I think there's a chance right now, Neto is projected to hit the bottom of the lineup. I think there's a chance he could hit high in the lineup by the end of the season. Um, he, for example, uh, the steamer projections have him as the leading base stealer on the team. Ron Washington might like that speedy guy. Um, they have his, uh, they have him with a 328 OBP, which isn't like, like great, but like it's better than Mickey Moniak who they have leading off right now by a lot. So I think there's a chance like, like assuming Trout's not going to lead off, assuming that Washington doesn't want Nolan Shanwell, who's doesn't run at all. He, he, he gets on base. Assuming They're talking about him being a two hitter. I've seen that. Right, with exactly. Lowe. So assuming yeah. he thinks in, and, and he's more like a traditional two hitter, mm-hmm. you know, maybe he puts Taylor Ward in the leadoff spot. That's possible. He gets on base, but if he doesn't want Ward there, like anyways, I, I can see a path to maybe if Neto is having a good season, maybe partway through the year, he starts getting some looks at the top of the lineup. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that works. So we were talking about Zach Neto there. We're talking about shortstops. Let's move over to outfield. The guys that the outfielders that Fred Zinke can't stop drafting. Oh, wait, you have the list. I don't have the list. Okay. Me. Cue me up, Jeff. All right. <laughs> I, I, it was, it was bad. Okay. Chaz McCormick. I like Chaz a lot. 2020 guy. Yeah, you, you mentioned on Twitter the other day that you drafted him and you said, if he's good enough for Fred, then he's good enough for me. And I was like, oh, that's a lot of pressure yeah. uh, for me. But yeah, I just, I don't like to fully prorate stats from the previous season, but 100, 403 at-bats, 115 games played, 22 homers, 19 steals. Like, it's easy to see a path for him to be like a 25-25 guy or or better if he mm-hmm. played 145 or something games this year. And I think the playing time is totally available in Houston yeah. right now. He's clearly better than Jake Myers. In, in my opinion, he's a better hitter. He should be in the lineup basically every day. I think there's a chance that he does end up prorating what he did last year across the full season. But even if he falls short of that, if he's where he's going, say around round 10 or 11 in a 15 team league, like if he's just a 2020 guy again with a decent batting average and a good lineup, I think that's worthwhile. Yeah. My, my projection, I, I did give him more plate appearance and yet it's still a little modest. I got him at uh, 483 plate appearances. He had 457 last year. So it's not that big of a bump. You know, I, I have for 21 and 14, I've got him for an 811 OPS. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, and that yeah. with McCormick, that's that, that's, you know, it's lower rate stats than what McCormick had last year. Yeah. But, you know, he might get McCormick might get 150 games. New manager here, Joe yes. Espada. You know, he might just say, okay, you know what? I'm not starting Mauricio Dubon ahead of McCormick that often. McCormick is our best center fielder and I don't want to take him out. That could happen. Uh, I, I feel like I'm, I'm like one of the sports casters do putting words into an a, a manager's mouth. So I'm going to be careful about that, but still McCormick's pretty good. I mean, it might, it might be both Myers and McCormick out there. And then Jordan as the DH. Yes. I think that's going to yeah. be the most likely scenario. And Dubon gets in there a little bit, but I don't think it's McCormick that gets hurt. I think, you know, you get you know, against lefties. Myers is going to sit uh, for instance there. And I don't think McCormick sits against righties that, that often. Uh, I, I think I, I like, I like Chaz too. Alex yeah, Verd- Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say there's a bunch of kind of toolsy outfielders that go in that same range, like around 10, 11, 12. He's one of them. He's one of the mm-hmm. ones that I often take. Again, like we talked about with Marte, like he's just another guy who just is a foundational pick where he doesn't move you into power, he doesn't move you in speed, he doesn't move you in batting average. He just keeps adding to all of your totals. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that's right. Uh, one tool that we have on RotoWire, if you're looking for, uh, I, I was just, I, I saw like, 
We have uh, one of the things we have on RotoWire is our batting order tool. I, and I've been told I need to talk about our tools more often, our lineups, our daily lineups, our uh, our batting order and batting order changes. We have all these things that you can check out on RotoWire right now. If you go to a, a lineups uh, tab and you can see all that, the batting order page, you can list where players are batting. So Jose Altuve is pretty much the the the, the leadoff hitter for them. And McCormick's been batting a little bit lower. Uh, he's been batting seventh more often than not, but it's something worth watching there a little bit. Um, just to see if maybe McCormick does move up, uh, against Mackenzie Gore, a lefty McCormick did bat lead off on March 1st. So you can see there were some, some moments against lefties where McCormick was a lead off hitter. A couple of against righties too, Flaherty and Cabrera, he, he hit lead off, but for the most part, it's Altuve and McCormick's been batting seventh. Uh, that could, that could definitely improve. That could definitely change. You know, and granted, spring training lineups come with the appropriate, you know, metric ton of salt because a lot of times you're getting half and half. So that's something to watch out for. But yeah, we we have a batting order tool. You guys need to check that out. Yeah, and and McCormick, yeah, that's where I expect him to bat is like six, seven. Guys will get hurt. He'll move up to six or five or things like that at times. But I'm not expecting him to bat high in the lineup. And you're right that that tool is going to be really useful all season. Yeah, it is. Yep. It is. So uh, uh, that and our projected starters grid, those ones, I two of them that I just swear on. Uh, yep. So you guys uh, check that out. All right. This is another outfielder that, you know, it's not like, oh, it's not expensive. It's not huge. But Alex Verdugo on the Yankees now, you're getting him a lot. So boring. I mean, look yeah. at this guy who drafted Andrew Vaughn and Alex Verdugo yep. on the same team. World so needs far. dish diggers, too, Fred. Yeah, that, <laughs> that, that, that's... It's true. These true. are building blockers. Another seven hitter, by the way. Uh, yeah. I think in the case of Verdugo, you know, he's had some injury issues this spring, uh, leg issue, but he did return uh, last week. Was batting seventh, Natch. Uh, so uh, you know, pay attention to that. But uh, he he could move up if Judge is missing time too, and he could be batting yeah. closer to Soto. You want that, obviously. My issue with Verdugo is. He's got to do something. He doesn't hit for a whole lot of power and he doesn't run. I mean, you're talking 13 and five. I'd like him to do one or the other. Um, or or if he's not, then I, I need to be able to bank the high batting average. And last year he didn't do that either. He's 264. No. So I'm expecting the batting average to rebound a bit. Like he is a career 281. I'm going to go with just, you know, career sample size over uh, one year. I mean, he's still a player in his 20s. Um, his strikeout rate didn't jump or anything. Um, so I don't see like it did jump a little bit year over year, but overall, like compared to his career, it didn't jump. So, mm -hmm. um, I think the batting hours will come back up. So let's say he can go back to being a 280 hitter. I think there's a chance that Yankee Stadium helps his power a little bit. Like, I think Yankee Stadium plays better for left handed hitters than Fenway does. So, okay, if Yankee Stadium could help take that homer total of 13 and maybe make it 17 or 18, I, again, he's someone I'm taking as. I don't know. Let's see where, what round were we in? And I took him around 20 in, uh, in labor. Uh, I took him in another league and probably about the same spot, 1920. Again, he's just, he's just a late round. I'm drafting a lot of late outfielders. I find I'm struggling. I find I like the infielders better in the first 10 or 15 rounds than the outfielders. So I'm often hitting the late round, still needing two or three outfielders when I round out my hitting group. And he's just one of those accumulators in the late rounds. He's definitely not an upside pick. I'm trying to mix in some Zach Nettos, like some other guys who are upside picks. Um, Verdugo is just a guy who hopefully plays every day in a solid Yankees lineup, maybe 70 runs, 70 RBIs. Hopefully I can hopefully gets over 15 homers. You know, but I, I like what you're saying here. And one thing I like late round accumulators, because sometimes they, you know, everybody says, well, he doesn't have any ceiling. You know, everybody's got a, a ceiling and just they're major league baseball players that if they're playing every day, they always have a chance to hit that 90th percentile, that 95th yep. percentile season. And, you know, getting guys like that late is often a value because people are trying to troll for prospects. Then they're trying to troll for oh, this guy, this this guy could close and he's like the third reliever on the team and you're getting a guy that plays every day. Yeah. I kind of like that a little bit there. Uh, and you, you can't have everybody with, Oh yeah, I'm excited about that. You, it's true. The world does these. Yeah. yeah you just, you, you're right. You, you can't draft a whole team of 23 year olds. Yeah. Right. Like you can mix them in. Like, like in our labor draft, I drafted Verdugo a couple rounds later. I drafted Johan Rojas. Like there's, mm -hmm there's an upside play on my bench, right? Maybe he steals 30 bases. Like there's an upside play. Maybe he's in the minors and I cut him, but yeah. you need the accumulators and Verdugo, like he's 27. He'll be 28 during the season. Like 
going to a great park to hit home runs, like maybe he can add a little bit of power. We'll see. Like, like you said, like there are guys like this who are just boring accumulators. And then one year, all of a sudden, Alex, we may look back and be like, Hey, remember that one year Alex Verdugo hit 23 homers? Like yeah. stuff like that does happen with the accumulator sometimes. Yeah. Um, uh, cow Chad TTV says, I feel like Jeff took a shot at me with uh, my love for Abner Uribe. No, I love him. Um, and now with Devin Williams and head news with his, you going to see a spine specialist. Ugh, I mean, why not? I mean, I like pie amps too. I, I, I think your rebate is probably third in line, but look at the, your rebates numbers. They're good. I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't mind that. I don't want five of those guys. I want one shot of one of those guys probably right. in the last round. I want to take Verdugo and then take your rebate later on. Cause you know what? He's going to be cheaper. Your Abner, your rebate is going to be cheaper than like spitballing here. Jason Adam for instance, mm -hmm. you know, who's a, a fine pitcher and a great speculation on the raise. I get that, but he's going to cost you more. He's going to cost you a full-time player. Whereas your eBay's, you know, he's essentially free at the end of drafts. So I like that there a little bit. Um, so th th that's something that, that they could talk about. So and you also mentioned Brendan Donovan. He, he exists too. I don't want to go well, into deep on that, but he's can't on draft your list. too many of these guys, but I often draft like one of them or something. Right. in in that, in that range, he's another, Another boring accumulator. Well, and keep in mind with all the news coming out of St. Louis, negative injury news out of St. Louis, Donovan's going to play. Edmund's going to begin the year on the IL, uh, mm -hmm. almost certainly. Newt um, bar, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Newt Bar with the fractured ribs. That's another one there. Yeah. So let's move on to starting pitchers. Uh, okay. We've got one early ish one Grayson Rodriguez on the Baltimore Orioles. So I guess I'll go ahead and jinx him. He is on every single team that I've drafted so far, which. I think he might be the only player who's on every single team that I drafted. So wow, far. how early are you taking him? Altuve might be too. I can't remember, but Grayson Rodriguez is. Uh, I've had some round fours, like late round four. So and say a like fifteen pick, teamer like, were speculating. Yeah, fifteen teamers. So say picks like 55, 56, 57. Okay. But then I, in my most recent draft, I got him in round five. So say about pick like sixty five or so. Um, I don't know. I just kind of about where he goes now. Yeah, it he... is. I'm a little early on him. So basically there's like a, a group of pitchers in that range and uh, Zach Eflin and uh, um, Logan Gilbert. There's a handful of pitchers in that range. And I kind of take Rodriguez usually at the front of the group. Um, mm -hmm. I did take Aaron Nola over him in a draft recently, but then, the, but then Rodriguez hung around and I just took Rodriguez the next round and took both of them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Rodriguez to me, pretty simple um at the start of last season he was awful but he also had terrible luck and for a rookie pitcher having terrible luck like it just all compounded it was awful but then he went down he comes back up and all of us and when he comes back up he's really good and when i step back and look at rodriguez i'm just like wait this guy was supposed to be awesome the second half of last year he was awesome his team's awesome his park is awesome i think i'm in i just like like he, he has a, he's been pretty durable so far. I, I feel like, um, doesn't have a huge injury history. I mean, he's a pitcher, so anyone can get hurt, but I don't know. I kind of like him there to maybe make 30 starts, strike out about a batter printing, maybe a little better than that and have good ratios and win a plenty of games on Baltimore. So I like him. I do feel every time I take him, I feel a little uneasy because he doesn't mm -hmm. have a huge track record, but uh, I don't know if, if he could do the second half of last year times two, he'll be a great pick this year and he'll go in the first three rounds next year. All right. Talking Grayson Rodriguez there. If you get sniped on Grayson Rodriguez and you've started hitter hitter, uh, and you need a starting pitcher, who's your pivot? Uh, Zach Eflin probably. Uh, yeah. If I couldn't get Rodriguez, I probably would look at Zach Eflin, maybe Logan Gilbert. Okay. Logan okay. Gilbert. I feel like mostly just been the same pitcher every year. And <laughs> in his short career, that, there's uh, value in that. And I'm pretty comfortable way. with who he's been. So I might take, I might take uh, Gilbert. It's a, it's a close one for me. I probably take Gilbert over Eflin, but I do like Eflin this year. I think I have no shares of Eflin just because I keep drafting at the front end and I don't, he's, I don't take him at start around five and then he's not there when I go in round six. Um, I think I like you're him. just, a, I think it's just a league selection thing. Uh, yeah. I think you're unlucky, but I, I feel like I'm in the same boat as you because I don't have any Eflin. I like him. Uh, and yet I look at the ADP and, you know, Zach Eflin just, you know, just granted, we're talking even super recent here. We're just talking mm -hmm. the last week. He, you know, he, he's going at pick, 
82, whereas Grayson's going to pick 67, like a full round later. Um, you can get both. Why not both? Um, yeah. You can do that. Or, yeah. or I like Bobby Miller in that range. Um, I see Cole Reagan's going higher and higher. And God, that walk rate scares me. So I haven't been going Cole Reagan's at all. Um, I could be wrong. I mean, throw so darn hard. Um, I get uh, Tanner Bybee later. Uh, Ritz is asking about uh, thoughts on Tanner Bybee. I like Tanner Bybee a lot. Um, you don't have to pay the price that in, in that range, but I like Bybee as my SP3. I, I, sometimes I'll even take him as my SP2. Um, so there you go. Um, I, that, that's a guy I like quite a bit. Um, I was going to mention the guy I never get, who I'm just unlucky in leagues, is Freddie Peralta, who I have ahead of Rodriguez. And based on his ADP, he should be available to me in round four in a lot of these drafts. And he has never been available to me. He all, Every draft I'm in, he goes at the beginning of round four and doesn't hmm. make it to me. I do think in main event season, he's going to move up and go on the three, four turn all the time. Um, okay. But, in, but based on an FBC ADP over the last little while, I should have had the option of taking him late in round four or the middle of round four. That never happens in my leagues. Yeah, I, I do have early Freddie Peralta, but nothing recently. Uh, yeah. as far as that goes, I like him. I would take him over Rodriguez. That's part of the reason I keep ending up with Rodriguez is like I said, there was one draft where I got Nola and then Rodriguez, but usually Nola goes Peralta goes. I don't love the hitters really in round late round four or five, like Nico Horner. I like, but not if I've already drafted a big steals guy. Mm -hmm. uh, you've talked, I know with Scott about being out on Bellinger at his ADP. I, I get that. Yeah. So I just find I don't, there's so many pitchers on the four or five turn and there's not a lot of hitters and, and, and I, and I'm out on taking a closer that early this year. So I just, I have to take a starter and I keep taking Grayson Rodriguez. All right. And then uh, I'm not doing my diversification plan from last year that we've talked about where I didn't take Strider because I didn't want to load up on too much Strider. So I took Nola and cool. then in a later draft, I didn't take Nola. So I took Alcantara because I didn't want it too much. Uh, and then all of a sudden it's trickled down to the point where, Anyways, I should have just taken all the striders. So this year I've been from that, whether I've taken, whether it's the right takeaway or not, like I'm following my list. If Rodriguez is the guy, he's the guy on every team. Well, and especially when it's someone you're like really like pounding the table for that you really like. Yeah. You shouldn't diversify from that. I, I almost a couple of times I did almost just take Logan Gilbert ahead of him just to diversify. But I was like, oh, no, like just the team I go to diversify on will be the team where everything else clicks, including. And if Rodriguez. I would have had that stud starter, if yeah. I would have had Grace and break yeah, out. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Chad says he pivots to Joe Ryan can be the same pitcher. Your thoughts on Joe Ryan. I'm not a, I'm not against him, but I actually put him, I did an article uh, for Vlad Sedler's site um, over the winter and I put him as a guy who I won't draft. And then I actually drafted him in a league. So <laughs> there you go. But what's is it? The article for Vlad was so early that I hadn't done my, I hadn't finished my projections yet. And, a lot of the indicators with Joe Ryan, I didn't really like all the home runs and everything. So I was like, Oh, I'm not going to take him." When I got into the, my actual projections, because he's a whip guy, like career one eleven whip, uh, he actually comes out fine in my projections. And I did take him in a league as my number two starter, I think. So yeah, I don't mind him round like seven or so in a 15 teamer. I think Joe Ryan's, I think he's fine. He's not someone I'm chasing, but good strikeout rate and, and low whip. That's a pretty good foundation right there. And Joe then you just cross your fingers on the air, right? So I did this thing uh, where I tweeted out the top K K minus walk percentage, um, yep. minimum of 80 that. innings. Yep. And Joe Ryan is pitcher five on yep. that list. It goes Strider, Scoobal, Glasnow, Matt Strom. People didn't, re that's, that's one that eludes people, I think. And then Joe Ryan. I mean, I think he's got a go for ball issue. Uh, Joe Ryan does, but uh, I, I was more in on him after seeing that list. I was more in on, Nick Pavetta after seeing that list and Cutter Crawford as a guy and Christopher mm -hmm. Sanchez are two guys yep. that I've been adding a lot of lately too. Uh, you know, it's not the be all end all stat, but it's a good one. It's, it, it portends it's great, to having yeah. a good whip and good case. These are things I like. Yeah. Yeah. I can't be out on someone who's that high on, on such on, on a list that is, is usually a pretty good determinant of fantasy success. So, Right. Or at so least I'm, fine, I'm fine with him at his ADP. He's not someone who I end up with all the time, but I'm fine mm -hmm. with him. He's also in a range where I often take closers. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Paulie asks, who's Fred's must draft Canadian player? Do you have I, one? The closest I would have this year would be Bo Naylor. 
I have oh, him on a couple teams. Oh, I like Bo Naylor a lot. I like yeah, that. Yeah, I have him on a couple teams. I don't have any Josh Naylor because I usually like to wait for that other pocket of first baseman later. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, uh, yeah, so I think it would be Bo Naylor. Maybe if maybe if the rest of the room lets me, I'll take Joey Votto at the very end of the Tout Wars draft and fold league. But it'd have to be really late because I don't, I don't think he's going to. I hope he does well. Player. I hope Votto does oh, well for your Jays. He's already provided a lot of great interviews. So. Yep. Yeah. I'm not, yeah, I love Joey. Yeah. Uh, late pitchers. We won't spend too much time on them. John Means, Charlie Morton are two guys. Morton's not late. Um, he's mid. No. Uh, but John Means is definitely late. Yeah, I just, I took him in uh, Tout Wars because draft and hold. So the injury doesn't really matter. It's not going to jam up my bench. I had so many pitchers on the bench anyways. One of the things about all the injured pitchers is me. Um, I heard, an, I can't remember which podcast I was listening to, but I heard it one the other day talking about the difference between, I think it was a CBS one, talking about the difference between injured and behind. And mm -hmm. like, like means I think is fine and progressing, but just is behind. So he's going to miss the first say four weeks of the season. Um, he's not like Garrett Cole where we don't know what's going on. Like, like means is pitching. He's ramping up. Mm -hmm. He's just behind. So okay. I, I think I can live with that. I took him in one NFBC league late, like round 26 or something, 27. If I have to cut him, I'll cut him like for a hot shot on the waiver wire. Um, but I think I could hold him three or four weeks. I haven't been drafting. Like I drafted Kershaw in our labor league because we have unlimited IL, but yeah. Anything with a limited, anything without unlimited IL, I've been avoiding like Kershaw, Scherzer, the guys who you have to of course. for months. Right. But, but, but means three or four weeks, I think I could do that. I think means he's interesting to me because he's always been a great whip pitcher. And then he hasn't really got a chance to pitch. His career area is 374. There's nothing wrong with that. He hasn't really got to pitch in the new Cannon Yards. Like he hasn't got the pitch, point. period. That's what That's I mean. Like four, four starts last year. Like he hasn't the 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 new pitcher friendly nature of Camden Yards is not in his career numbers. You know what? Neither are strikeouts, though, ever. No. Nope. Um, and that's yep. the thing. Like he, he's ruptured that Achilles twice now. Is that gonna yep. change how he pitches? I don't know. We'll Might. see. A lot, um, yeah, for sure. Certainly uncertainty. That's why I'm getting him in like the very final round. Well, yeah, game. exactly. And I don't mean, I, I, I sound a little more critical than I, I intended. Um, you know what? 2021 was his last year where he started with any significance. 26 starts, 134 strikeouts and 146 and two thirds innings. So that's not terrible. Again, that's not Miles Michaelis where you're like 50 or 40 fewer inning strikeouts than innings. Right. Like 134 and 146. That's not bad. So could mm -hmm. he, could he be, if in theory, he could come back, he can miss a few starts, come back make those 26 starts. I, I'm probably wishing a little too much with that, but, and get 134 strikeouts. That That's my high end on him. But anyways, if by I have the to way, cut him, I have to cut him, but I don't, Miles I, I Michaelis don't. is not that bad, by the way. I, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I, maybe I, I, it's just, I had such bad experiences with him last he, year. He was, he was bad last year. At, last year, he had 137 on. in 201 innings. That's so bad for strikeouts. Yeah, but if you got 137 Ks period from a pitcher, yes. I mean, it's not that bad. But what happens when I do my projections is, so, hey, this is, I, okay, if you don't have Miles Michaelis up in front of you right now, how many starts do you think he made last year? 32. How about 35? I don't ever remember no. a guy making 35 starts. Like, when oh, was what, the what last, is this, 1979? Right. <laughs> when was the last time you saw, I don't remember ever seeing 35 starts on a, on a pitcher Boy, profile. I'll tell you what, that just how illustrates that how much things have changed in baseball. You yeah. never see a guy pitch on three days rest. Never, ever. And it used to be, we used to have four-man rotations, Fred. Now, granted, it's the strikeout revolution. We've We've optimized and realized, okay, it's not great pitching to contact like that. It's not great, uh, you know, you know, trying to uh, yeah. just go that. But I'll tell you what, it allows teams to carry that extra hitter. It allows teams to, you know, you know, have or or another flame floor reliever instead of having some crummy six starter. Um, I, I think that so he, he did all the things for. He started the first game. He started the last game. He started yeah. right out of the break. He started shortly before the break. Like he did everything that could possibly lead to it. I don't remember yeah. seeing. I should go back and look at the last time a guy started 35 games in a season. Um, I might have to downgrade him one start just because that, you know, you're using like any sort of averaging there that's like, well, yeah. 35 starts. He should make 32 or no problem. 33, no problem. Um, I've got him for 30 starts. I've got Mike, Miles Michaelis for 30 starts somehow. Okay, I'm good. We're good there. I'm How just going to leave him as. 
Oh, uh, I've got Miles Michaelis for 125 strikeouts. That's, that's not great. Yeah, that's so little. Like for 30 starts, like to yeah. have, to have him in your lineup all season to get 130 strikeouts. But the you wouldn't have him in your lineup. I know all season. No, you're spotting him. Your yeah. home starts, good two start weeks, and all that. But he's he's better than. I don't know what he's better than. I don't know. His strikeout rate among guys, I think, who start all the time is like probably, or it will strike out late last season. The season before was still pretty bad. He still had about 50 fewer strikeouts. But when I say stream from your bench, this is the guy I'm talking yep, about. Yep, he is. Though. Yep, for sure. Yeah. Yep, yeah, based on the matchups. Maybe I should start, maybe I should go after Dakota Hudson. His strikeout rate is also awful. And he's on the Rockies now, but his strikeout yeah. rate, he was another guy who just, yeah. when he was on the Cardinals, such a terrible strikeout rate that you, I didn't want to use him. Right. Okay, let's go to relievers here, and I uh, we definitely have a conflict with one of these. Oh, yeah. um, you the have a lot of Craig Kimbrell. Yeah. I'm probably besmirching the man, but I just can't get out of my head that he's lost the job in places lately, and including the Dodgers right before the playoffs. I, I just I just can't power pass it. Incredible career. I know he misses bats. Uh, I just want guys to have the job, though. Yeah, so my theory on taking him is that he's like, he fully has the job. Like when other teams talk about like Evan Phillips, like when the Dodgers are saying like, he's going to get the bulk of the saves and like the Cardinals with Ryan Hell, these are guys who go around the same. Usually they go before Kimbrel, but Ryan Helsley and he gets hurt all the time. And the Cardinals have all these other weapons in the bullpen and are like, yeah, he's going to be the primary saves guy. When the Orioles brought in Craig Kimbrel, they're just like in December, they were just like, that is our closer. We're bringing him in. He's the closer. Like when I read the news articles, I was like, they have brought this guy in to just be Felix Batista to be the closer. End of story. Full stop. So I think he gets all of their saves in a traditional closer type manner. As long as he can handle it, he could totally blow the job. Um, That's that's the thing is I think he will blow the job. But he could also get, but if he could just have the 326 ERA he had last year pitching for the Phillies, Mm -hmm. uh, he'd get 40 saves. Like they will use him as a traditional closer on a good, on a team that will probably win 90 games or more 90 or who knows 95. I don't know. I like the Orioles. I have a lot of Orioles pitchers. I find I often draft a lot of them between grace. And and that's fair. John means I have some Dean Kramer anyway. So my thought on Kimbrell is like, he's going to get like a, like compared to other, some other closers who go in the same range, he's going to get a lot of, saves as long yeah. as he holds the job he also has been really durable um i mentioned this on a previous podcast but he hasn't been on the il since last time he was on, on the il was 2019 so that part's been good he doesn't have a huge workload but 69 innings last year 60 the year before uh 59 and two-thirds the year before that like i don't know if he could throw 60 innings i think he can get 35 saves sure I, I, totally and on the price is right on it's, him yeah you know average pick is 132 you know I, I'm I might grit my teeth on that and say eh, I don't want him, but yeah, I, I your argument is salient. Uh, I, I get that. Um, and he's been fine the last couple of years, like 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 326 last year with Phillies, 375 with the Dodgers wasn't great, but it's not horrendous. Like you could lose your job with a 375 ERA, but you might not. Like you could hang on to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the year before he was awesome, to 2021, 226 ERA and 100 strikeouts. Right. Uh, that he, year he split between the Cubs and the White Sox. So, and now he, you're going back before COVID after that. Like, it, like he had right. a couple of messy years. 2019 was, was messy for him, but that's so long ago. No, oh, yeah. And, he had and that was the year he was hurt. That's so, it. yeah. Yeah. Anyways, uh, I think I, I am a Craig Kimbrell apologist. And this year I'm putting my money where my mouth is. No apologies, bro. All yeah. right. Um, yeah. And he's the end of a tier too. Like, he is. Before him, it's Helsley and Holmes and Fairbanks and Bednar ahead of that. After him, it's Tanner Scott, and Scott uh, Jen's dad was talking about reasons why he's not comfortable with Tanner Scott in that walk rate. I buy that. Uh, I buy his argument, that is. And Albert Al- Albert Alzale, we don't know if he's even got the job. Uh, and then you have to wait. Kenley Jansen has dropped. He's yeah, down to 165. There's yeah. reasons. He's hurt right now. Yeah. Um, he's actively hurt right now. And then you have to drop, 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 drop to Jose Alvarado at 183, which has climbed, by the way. Um, it used to get used to get him right after two pick 200, not anymore. So you're starting to push up someone there. You don't know has the job. I, I get it. I mean, I do have, I did pass on Kimberl and took out Al- Alvarado and yogurt. That leg is still going on, by the way. Um, okay. just wanted to just say that by, <laughs> for the record, Alex Lang is, can miss a lot of bats, but he can miss a lot of 
clubs too unfortunately he, he's wild um and you know we saw today like jackson job could replace him someday mason miller looks like he might win the job even after the ace said he wouldn't win right away i mean that's possible uh the guy i like really late if you miss on all that tier and you as your second closer i've been finding myself turning to robert suarez a lot more lately yeah i think he's going to get the job in san diego i think he's a really good pitcher i just think suarez has an issue staying healthy Yep, agreed. But at that price point, uh, I think then he's worth the risk, right? Yep. Um, I agree. I, he's probably not going to blow up your ratios. The worst case is, you know, maybe you take him and six weeks into the season, he's got an injury and you didn't really get much out of him. But he didn't kill you and he's disappointing. Um, I'm not 100% against Kyle Finnegan either. Um, oh, I, I like, give me Henry. I, mean, I, 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 I don't know. I just, Finnegan took that closers role back in the second half of last year. And, um, and God, I think it was 17 to, to two saves versus Harvey. So um, I'm not, to- again, it's because Finnegan's really cheap. I'm not, if any, like no one should take away from this. Like Fred says, draft Finnegan. Don't put that please as the title for this. Fred, thing, but- <laughs> Fred is, you know, we'll leave you I, in his wake. If you don't take Finnegan. I don't think it's a terrible pick, but anyways, I've avoided that in every so i like kimbrell more than every single reliever you've mentioned even for back at the beginning when you were talking about how he's the tail end of the tier i like him less i think than evan phillips because i think phillips is really good um but i like him once the previous tier with munoz and diaz and those pitchers once that tier is gone then i'm kind of wait find to wait around and take kimbrell um yeah, and then I'm just staying out of everybody that you mentioned, all the Jansons and Suarez's and Finnegan's. I'm just trying to avoid having to dip in them. And instead, I'm trying to draft accumulator hitters in that phrase in my draft. Or like Charlie Morton types or someone who yeah. may be awesome, maybe just okay, but I know he's going to like have value. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that, or you didn't mention, but you listed in our, your, our outline that you also get a lot of Alexis Diaz. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's often my first closer. Again, waiting because I've been typically waiting for a lot of uh, a lot of relievers to to go off the board. Like for say whatever six, seven, eight relievers go off the board before I jump in. Um, people are down on Alexis Diaz. I don't totally see it. I think he's pretty good. I I think he's a good I'm, closer. I'm with you. I think the Reds are. I think the Reds are liking him. When you go back and look at his game log from last year, and you would know this as a Reds fan, he's cruising along with a two ten. ERA. That's amazing. On September 19th, this is so late in the year, he had a 2.10 ERA. He has a blow up on September 20th where he gives up three runs. He has a blow up on his next outing on September 23rd where he gives up four runs. And that yep. pushes his ERA up into the threes. And then after that, he goes two two consecutive appearances with with uh, without any runs allowed. And then his very last outing of the year, he comes in a 15 to 6 loss. And uh, faces three batters and they all get on base. How many times have we seen the closer in the 15 to six loss when he comes in just to get work? Right. Like, thanks a lot, Reds. I didn't have him in a lot of leagues last year, but thanks a lot, Reds, for bringing him in in the 15 to six loss. But and, thank uh, but thank the Reds yeah. because you got, you're got you getting Alexis Diaz around cheaper because yeah, of him. you're right. You're right. So, I don't know. I like him. I, he strikes batters out. Um, he's got a bit of a control issue, but I don't think it's, it's egregious, but he strikes batters out. Uh, I think he is their closer and there's no real alternatives and yeah, I, I'm fine with them. So I often end up with him and Kimbrel. uh, maybe him in like, like Diaz in round six and then Kimbrel later in round like eight or nine. I either get, I get a lot of Diaz and I get a lot of Seawald. Uh, yeah, you guys. like Seawald this year. He's one of your guys. I often take Diaz or Munoz and then I find Seawald I goes after that. And then I come back with. Kimbrel yeah. Munoz, I also hesitate sometimes when I pick him, but man, I just think he's a really good pitcher and and he should be their their full time closer, especially with Brash hurt. All right, gun to the head or uh, poutine to the head. Uh, I don't know. I was just making some sort of silly <laughs> Canadian comment. You have to take a either a Rockies reliever or a White Sox reliever. Who are you taking? Wh- which, which team and which pitcher? Are you taking? Uh, oh. <laughs> John Brebbia, I guess. Brebbia is a little banged up. Just want to say that, but uh, he's, he's on track for opening day. Yep. The injury was a calf, a calf. not yep. an arm. Um, 
got I do find this year, as an fine. aside, I do find this year that every time a pitcher has anything wrong with him in spring training, he's now in doubt for opening day. Like spring training with the with the now having opening day more like late March than at say like it's never like April you, anymore. Never be more like April fourth or fifth or something like that. Now it's more like March twenty eighth, like this year. So you take that week off. I find every time these guys. Like Brebby, I feel like came to spring training, had a sore calf, and they're like, "Oh, he might not be ready for opening day." And I'm like, "What? Are we cutting it this close? Like, where if anything?" But goes, we are. I we mean, are. And, and it's because of expanded playoffs, and now that yep. players have like they've exercised like a minimum number of off days, a, a maximum number number of days in a row. Uh, and if you want to exceed that, you have to get p- permission from the players' union and uh, from the teams themselves. And good on that. Um, so yeah, I I think I go Brebbia. I I just you know there are years where I've drafted Daniel, like I drafted Daniel Bard. I think it was at last year or two years ago, and I immediately regretted it. I almost always just ignore Rockies relievers, Rockies pitchers. Period. Just not on my list. Just makes it easier. Just granted, I'm playing yeah. with a 29 oh, man closer yeah. pool and maybe 28. Like I don't have any Mason Miller this year, and I kind of maybe regret that because he could be very good. But he also could not close, in which case, am I messing around with a non-closing A's pitcher? No, I don't want to do that. Um, White Sox off my list. I mean, it, all of a sudden, you, you, you now I'm kind of boxing myself in a little bit, but at the same time, you know, that gives me some clarity. Means and it just nudges me to say, "Hey, got to go a little earlier here." Yeah, I. By the way, on the topic of Mason Miller, I don't get. Maybe it'll happen. Maybe he'll be the closer. I don't get that at all. So let's start with the premise that none of the A's games matter this year. Like the, like the, right. the A's have already given up on this year. So him getting him, like saving games, like, yay, we won. Like doesn't matter this year. Um, I don't understand if they're, if they're kind of like, if they're limiting his innings and trying to really control his usage because he's this future ace. I don't understand why he would be the closer and work an erratic schedule and, you know, two days on three days off. Whatever. I don't understand why they wouldn't just say, okay, you're pitching two innings every time you go out and you're going out every, every fourth day or something like that all season. I, to me, if, if the whole point of this whole season is just to develop and build up Mason Miller to be a starter next year, I don't see what the point of him being, if, if the A's were the blue Jays, that would make sense to me. They're yeah. trying to make the playoffs, but they're the A's. Like, I don't get it. I don't see why they don't just let any plug in their bullpen get the spread, or spread out the 26 saves they're going to produce or something amongst all their guys. And just let, I would just, I would just say to say, this is what Mason Miller's doing. He's pitching his innings six and seven every fourth day or whatever they want to do and just map it out and be like, that's what you're doing. Right. We don't even it care. It doesn't the matter the game situation. We're just getting him his work. We're just getting him, getting him work and all the innings. Uh, are- I think that's fine. I think I prefer that. Um, the problem is it's just how much he's been limited over his career, you yeah. know, including college. He's only exceeded 60 innings tw- or 52 innings. Tw- or, yeah. Top 60 innings twice. Mm-hmm. The most he's ever thrown is 98 innings. I understand if he may never be a starter. And I yeah. think that's, so if that's the direction that I, yeah, if they want to go that direction. Sure. Like just make him a closer and make him a reliever forever. See, and but... I think that's what they're doing. I really do. And he yeah. throws 103. So I get it. I mean, it's just yeah. like just max effort to be a reliever, but it does limit his value to the franchise. You know, obviously you need to you know, play, you know, just from a pure saber metric value standpoint, forget fantasy for a second more innings you throw the better more valuable are to yes. your team so i get that and, um, and for a team that's thinking down the road why not at least maybe try to make them a starter because you're more valuable and then and then if that doesn't work you can pivot back in a couple of years they <laughs> decide they want to care about baseball yeah. again i think it's because yeah. that ucl you know aches last year occurred i think that's why they're just like cold stop mm-hmm. we can't do that this year mm-hmm. I, I i think i understand why they do that yeah. um it's very few things i understand what the a's are doing but <laughs> Player player development wise, I don't think they're bad. I just think they're just such a cynical. Don't have any play- it's yeah, hard to divorce that to from the baseball ops, you yeah, know, for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. They they can develop players. They just don't have many players to develop right now. Right. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, we, we went through your list. Um, you stayed up late again, as always. Thank you for that. You, you're, you're a good Canadian. We appreciate you. <laughs> No problem. I enjoyed that. I enjoyed this. Now I've told everyone who I want to draft. So I guess I'm done drafting for the season. But that's no. your that's your fake list. You got a secret list there for your other yeah, drafts yeah. coming up. But, uh, <laughs> I can't right. believe they bought it. Yes.
Indeed. So next week, uh, I'll be doing an in only keeper league, but I think it should be done well before the podcast. But uh, we'll have lots to talk about. So. And you'll be done Tout Wars before we talk next week, right? Correct. Correct. Tout That's Wars is this weekend. A big deal. I guess you, well, so you're going to Tout Wars. Are you jumping on with Scott still on Sunday night? Or are you? No, I'm not this week. So I get to be the first guy to podcast with you after you do Tout Wars. Yes. And you can tell oh, me we're what going to have to dive in on all that. Is. All right. All that excitement. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Very good. I'll be playing an AL only tout on Saturday morning. I will be the auctioneer for the mixed league that you've used often have played in on Saturday afternoon. I'll be running the board for the head to head league on Sunday morning. And the NL is also Sunday morning. They'll be running an hour apart from each other. So running concurrently for a good chunk of that there flying back on Monday and we'll be back at it again. You and I on Tuesday. So coming up uh, tomorrow, we've got James Anderson as always on Thursday. Uh, I'm going to have Mike Alexander. We're going to have a best ball special. So people play in best ball leagues, hang in. That's that, It's going to be for you guys there on Thursday. So that'll be at uh, about 2.05 Eastern time uh, for that one. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks to Fan Tracks. Thanks to Rival Fantasy. Uh, thanks to Fred. Thanks to everybody. We good talking with everyone. Thanks for your, all the insights in the chat room. Appreciate you. Thanks for listening and take care.